Welcome back to another episode. We have a two four for you this time. Equally talented Simonsons, and uh, I, 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 yes, they stop it. <laughs> I'm. I, uh, he said he can write, write. He can draw. He yeah. can letter. Next time you're at a convention, ask for Sweezy's Superman drawing. Uh, that'll prove that it's I completely can't draw. charming. No. Char uh oh, charming. Is that the? <laughs> it is charming. <laughs> she she had to have learned something. From all the pe great pe great yeah. artists she's worked with, aside from being married to one, she but, learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mike, when did you first meet these guys? I, you know, I heard about Walt when I was living in Boston. I was working for newspapers, the Boston Phoenix and the Real Paper, from uh, 1971 to 1977, and I had a number of friends who were artists, and one of them had trained at the Rhode Island School of Design. And he said there was a guy there that he knew that was going on to, to work for Marvel Comics. And that was the first I'd heard of Walt. Uh, then I met him later at a convention. And, and although my memory remains hazy, we were both at a convention in England at one time. That's and right. we flew back together on the same plane and arrived at O-Dark 30. And uh, the Simonsons put me up for the night. They were kind enough to do that. So I didn't have to go looking for a hotel. And I've never forgotten that. Uh, and I've also uh, followed Walt's work ever since. And of course, he's most famous for his work on Thor and for create, creating Beta Ray Bill. But I think that most of us who have been in the uh, uh, in fanship for a long time know him from this. Hold yours up, Jeff. Hold yours up, Jeff. <laughs> And this is not when it came sure. out. It's uh, copywritten 1979. Of course, he did this with Archie Goodwin and uh, its brilliant work. Uh, and his style was fully formed by then. And that, that's something about Walt is that his style is instantly identifiable. He doesn't really draw like anybody else and nobody else draws like him. <laughs> but he's got that, that magic because his art is perfectly suited for superhero comics which he's been doing all these years. It's true. I mean, I, I did work at that. I, 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 mean, I just, I like comics. There's a, there's a, there was a book a million years ago called whole grains, Artie Spiegelman and somebody else edited it. I don't remember. And it's full of quotes just from all over the world and all over the different people, different fields, everything. And there's a great quote from Carl Barks and the quote from Carl Barks is, as I remember it, I'm a duck man. Strictly a duck man. <laughs> and that's kind of how I feel about, I'm a comics guy. Strictly a comics guy. So I don't haven't had ambitions to go out and do other stuff or get in the movies or TV or whatever it was. What I would like to be is the best possible storyteller I can be in comics. And so that's what I've worked at. And I've taken, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Jack Kirby's. Part of what I liked about Jack's work was the incredible energy in it. And if I've tried to take anything from Jack, I haven't tried to draw like Jack, but I have tried to imbue my work with the kind of energy I saw in Jack's that really excited me as a reader back really when I was in college was when I discovered Jack. So I had Marvel Comics in 65. So, well, I think you uh, succeeded at that. And, and well, not only that, you're sui generis. Uh, I think you're probably impossible to copy. Uh, Jack Kirby has uh, inspired dozens, if not hundreds, of imitators. Steranko has inspired his imitators. Neil Adams has inspired his imitators. But nobody dares to draw in a style like you. <laughs> that's, that's probably because I make it up as I go along. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just, there's, here's one more quote then, which I totally loved. This is Rudyard Kipling. It was from like, some silkscreen company. I did silkscreens a million years ago in art school. And someone like that had this quote from Rudyard Kipling, and it said, they copied all they could follow, but they couldn't copy my mind. And I left them sweating and stealing a year and a half behind. <laughs> and I thought that was great. And I, I will say, I mean, I have influenced a number of people. I know that. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I do think that I try, in a way, I try to solve every drawing problem as if I've never come across it before. I don't always succeed, of course. I mean, you see stuff I've done that I, I draw like this, and my stuff's very recognizable. But I try to 
not fall back in the formula as much as you can. After 50 years in comics, that's probably not entirely possible. But I, I knew, I saw other artists in the generations ahead of me whose work had become very formulaic over time. And I mean, they made a living, stuff was fine, it read well, um, but it was kind of not what I wanted to do if I could avoid it, knowing that if I were around for a long time, I probably wouldn't avoid it. But I have tried to refresh myself as every job comes along in one way or another. Did you ever thumbnail? Yes. Oh, all the time. Uh, I'm just about, this is, I, you won't be able to see too much in this. I'm, I don't take commissions mostly, but when everything shut down a couple of years ago, I, I agreed to do about 14 commissions. They were all single figures on 11 by 17 paper. Um, I probably charged slightly too, too less, too small amount for them, but I had not done them before, so I didn't know how much trouble they were going to be, or they weren't. They weren't bad, but I have one commission I'm doing. I'm just starting, which is about, it's the last one. And I, it's last because it's technically more challenging than anything I've done before. It's about 44 inches across and 50, I mean, 50 inches across and 44 inches high. And I'll be putting this up on, I have a more detailed drawing, somewhere, but this would be an example of the thumbnails where, the gentleman who wanted it wants a picture of Surtur fighting all of the Asgardians. So I have Surtur standing in a lake of fire in Muspelheim. You can see, whoop, where am I over here? Thor over here, Odin behind him. All the Asgardians will be down here. I would like to maybe put all the Asgardians Jack drew, I mean, all the individual characters, which would include Magrat the Schemer and Kroll of the Duelist, who were in like, you know, three panels. Um, I don't know if I'll get everybody in. Uh, a bunch of fire demons fighting as well. And that'll be big. I, that'll be a challenge to draw something that large. Show them. But that was a, well, I don't know if I could bring, I don't no, know if I can. That's, that's a big thing. Around. Around. I'll show you. We can show you what I figured. Thanks to Gene Scrocco and Greg Hildebrand, who are good friends of ours. Um, how am I going to do this? I pick Let's up the computer. The computer. All right. I'm going I'm to try to turn the computer around. If I drop it, uh -oh. this will be the quickest interview on record. <laughs> but we'll try and do it. What I've done yeah. is, uh, let me see if I can. Get this turned around. Like, we'll see if the wires. Shall I turn it horizontal? Can you see it there? Like, yes, you can. Yes. That giant purple this thing. Size, giant wow. Purple. Oh my! Oh my camera! Just let me get that out of there. Um, the giant purple thing is fo it's a foam board. It's insulation for the roof or something of that sort. It's two inches thick and it's about four feet by five feet. I have a giant pad of paper oh. that a friend of mine let me take some from, and. Uh, Hang on a second. We ended up getting uh, losing the picture. There we go. We should be back. There we go. Um, he he let me have a, a giant sheet of paper, which is long enough for two of these drawings. That way, if I screw one of them up, I can remount the paper on that board and start over again. But that's that'll be the biggest piece I've done. And uh, I'm just getting. But that's what that the layout was for. I've done a more thorough layout, and I will probably have to go to the old classic route of gridding my layout and then putting the grid on the actual paper and blowing it up in that fashion. So there are some other techniques. Old, I mean, this is like old master stuff. Yeah. I'll probably be trying as well, but we'll see how it comes out. I'll be posting bits of that on Facebook as I go along. It's not a secret. So, uh, so it's going to be a black and white? Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm a black and white guy mostly. I've done a little color over the years. Um, I think I colored the last three Manhunters. A million years ago, and a few other uh, oddball jobs, a Doctor Fate story that I drew, um, yeah. and some other stuff like that. But I don't do much color, and and having discovered Laura Martin and Paul Mount and some other guys who are just phenomenal, I, I it's much it's like lettering. I used to letter my own stuff. I discovered John Workman. I tried never to letter stuff again. John could letter my stuff the way I wanted it lettered better than I could do it. I was wondering about that if if that was all him because you did say you did a lot of your uh, sound effects and stuff too. Was that before him, or did you, or did he do all the stuff in Thor? Uh, he did virtually all the stuff in Thor. Um, I the early work I, when I first got into comics. This would include Manhunter. Um, I used to have the letterers do all the small lettering the, in the balloons and captions. Right. And I would do all the panel borders, all the balloon borders, all the uh, the cut lines on the outside. Um, and all my display lettering. So titles, sound effects, anything like that, I did myself. I wanted all the shapes in the drawing 
to be related to my drawing. Right. Because, you know, a word balloon in a drawing is really a positive shape inside that that panel. And I wanted that balloon to look like it, you know, came from my hand. So I'm sure I was a, a dream for a lot of letters because they got paid their full amount. Didn't have to bother any of that stuff for drafting out panel borders or doing the sound effects. And then when I, I began working with John on Alien uh, for Heavy Metal, a graphic novel adaptation of the movie Alien, John was the art director there. He's the guy who hired me, and he lettered it. And I discovered in his work a guy who could letter the way I would like to letter if I were better at it. And um, his background, I mean, his lettering approach to lettering is both calligraphic and typographic. And that's where my stuff comes from. So I found somebody who do what I can do, but better than I can do it. So I'm thrilled to have him letter this stuff. Um, yeah. On that one, we mentioned, we'll talk, we talked a little before the camera went on about the silent Manhunter story. And right. because that was Manhunter and I had done my own lettering on that, uh, or at least I'd done the sound effects, I did do the sound effects on that 23-page story. Um, because once again, it was the way we had done it. Archie had done it a million years earlier. Right. But for the most part, John does all the lettering, including us on a, on a, on an art piece of artboard where I've got a panel and I have a sound effect. I would draw a rectangle at whatever angle I want and the length I want it. Usually my scripts have a lot more letters than he can fit in. And he will just put in as many letters as fit. He'll drop some, he'll, wow. you know, we won't add any, but he'll drop some of the, you know, I'll put in 15 T's. He'll have three stuff like that, yeah, but he yeah. will. So the final sound effect is really a combination of John and me as to how it comes out. Okay. Have you worked for other publishers other than Marvel and Heavy Metal? Uh, I did a lot of work for my, my early work was for DC. Um, when I first came to New York to get into comics, uh, DC was producing the comics I was most interested in. I've been a Marvel guy in the 60s, uh, loved their stuff. But by the end of the 60s, the early 70s, I felt they were kind of repeating themselves. Uh, and DC was trying a whole bunch of stuff. A lot of it didn't last very long, but it was really cool. And so I went to DC first to try and get into the business and and was lucky enough to be able to do it. And I, I met Archie. He began feeding me small amounts of work that kept me alive. Uh, short job here, short job there. Usually backups for the war comics. And then finally, literally only about six months into the business, uh, he asked me if I wanted to draw this new strip he was going to do for the back of detective comics called Manhunter. And I said, sure. And that was really my entry into the business. Before I began that, I was one other new kid trying to get into comics. And when that was done, all the professionals knew who I was. The, yes, the, it had know, an enormous impact. It you know, won a bunch of awards. There wasn't the kind of fandom we have now, so there wasn't like a fan response the way there might be now to something like that, for good or ill. <clears throat> but we ended up um, becoming, well, Archie was already well known, but I became better known professionally because of that strip. And I never had to look for work again after that strip came out. Yeah, Archie was my editor, too, on a number of titles. He was great. He was the best. Yeah, he was a wonderful human being. Weezy, would you tell us how you came to Marvel? Um, Jim Shooter asked me <laughs> to come to Marvel. I was uh, I was at Warren Publishing. I was the editor in chief there, which was made me the you know a, a big fish in a really little tiny uh, goldfish bowl. Um, I, I had I had played played volleyball with the Marvel guys just because Walter played volleyball with the Marvel guys. And I guess they got to know me there. And I suppose they, I suppose Shooter was aware of the work that I did. So he asked me to come, come work at Marvel and I edit there. And I said, sure. Um, Jim Warren was very upset with me. He had spies all over the place and he <laughs> found out, he found out that I had gone out to lunch with Jim Shooter and I got back in the oh, office and that. he was just raw. He was like, I <laughs> leave this place immediately. Yeah, you know, whatever. Wow. <laughs> so I did. He was it was an intense life. human being. Uh, I went to New York once and I interviewed Jim Warren, Stan Lee, and Barry Smith. Oh, for, wow. For Cream Magazine. <laughs> I think it was all on the same day. <laughs> oh, that's quite an accomplishment. And you live yeah. to tell it. Yeah, but, but I'll never forget Jim Warren. Is he still alive? He yes, is. He is. One, I had a run in with Jim, my first guy when I came in New York, actually a couple of years before I got into comics. And 
it was kind of it was strange. Man, that's a whole other story. But uh, one of the great things about the way life turns out is that Jim Warren and Walter and Louise Simonson trade Christmas cards every year and occasional notes. Yeah, we sent him. We're, we sent him. You sent him a birthday drawing. And I sent him a birthday drawing. I did a drawing <laughs> of Vampirella and Uncle Creepy and Cousin Eerie, little head headshot, like a little three heads in a group. Yeah. And sent those off to him, and he was very pleased to get you it. You know, I always liked him. He was a little yes. volatile. <laughs> but I, 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 you know, he's kind of an amusing guy, and he really kind of let me do whatever I wanted to yeah. do, which was a lot of crazy stuff over at Warren. Yep. Um, so, you know, what's not to like, really? I mean, he would yell, but I told him that he was allowed to yell, but he wasn't allowed to yell at me. He could yell about things, which is different. And, you know, it worked out. that he, That was the way we, we had it. We, we had a system going. I mean, he could, he could be he was, just a complete pain in the ass. Yes, he could. But he could also be the most charming creature on God's green earth. And, you know, he was actually very smart. And he had he a was. lot of good ideas. So, yeah. And, and he had a real eye for talent. Yes, he did. Yep. I mean, he, gra- we, he employed a lot of people early who then yeah. went on to do, you know, some pretty cool stuff. Great so. stuff. Including, our, well, Archie was one of the one Ar- of absolutely early Archie. there. So Did he ever beginning. tell you about a World War One airplane he was restoring? Oh yes, oh. we saw it. But we 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 were out at his beach house. Yep, a million and a half years. A million ago. and a half years ago. And he had he had a he had his own home on the north right. shore of Long Island, way out on the island. And he also somewhere a half an hour away, a little more in, he had a like a cabin that he. Could put people up at a cabin, a beach house, it's a like little, a, like a little beach, beach house, house a guest there. house, and he would he would put people there. I think probably people he was trying to schmooze. Yeah, or the, and then he would let the people from the office go if there wasn't anybody. That's right. <laughs> really uh, spectacular book. So we were all out there one time, and uh, I have to say, boy, Jim knew how to spend money. I mean, he's he's he spent it in wonderful ways. So he had us all come over. We were all out there for a week. Uh, Wheezy and me and some other people. Oh, Debay and Debe, uh, Mahali and all the uh, people. One of the writers there. whose name I, I'm blank was a good writer, but I forgot his name. Toomey, no, it wasn't Toomey. It was one well, of the other guys. Knows, anyway, we ended up, he invited us out to his beach house for a, an afternoon. We went there. And you, when you drove up the on the road, the driveway went off and the driveway went, it was a traffic, like a little circle that went in front of the house and then came around again. You went back out and sitting in the circle, I'm going to have to, rem- I don't remember this for a dead certain. I think it was a sop with camel. Yes. It was a, a full size sop with camel. And so right then I said, I want to be this guy. <laughs> I want to be the guy that has a sop with camel in front of him. My- yeah, I'm yeah. still working on that. I don't have one yet. He had his own jukebox. He had his own jukebox. He yeah. had had records pressed, 45. So it had all his, you know, Sing, Sing, Sing by Benny Goodman. And all the songs he liked were in the jukebox. And the, uh. the, the back side of the house was on the beach. Right. It faced the beach and the Long Island Sound. And between the house and the beach, there was a deck. And in the deck was a sunken pool. So you had a pool you could swim in, or you could hop up, jump onto the beach, and go out and swim in the sound. Yeah, yeah. He knew how so to it was it. really, it was nice. It was really a nice... Uh, and then, just to make it sure, a Jim Warren story, there were two big tanks oh, right. beside the house. I mean, there were six feet high or thereabouts. Might have been propane no, tanks, propane, propane tanks, I think. Were, yeah. And and he and and on that side of the house, there was an apartment, like a long apartment building that that the, the, the it was long wise toward the ocean. So it was like this, and so all these windows facing his house. And so on the house, he had painted or had somebody paint in line art, very simple cartoon drawings of a naked man and a naked woman. And they were anatomically correct. And he got a lot of complaints from the people who lived in the apartment building. And he could have cared he less. Was doing, he did the retaliation for something. There's something they, had had done. S- they had a few going. They through. had some stuff going back and forth. That's right. I don't remember what it was. There character. was some stuff going back and forth. So that was his revenge. So Was, the, was publishing the source of his, his wealth? Yes. At well, that, that, that at that time, I think he. I mean, he quit publishing eventually. To I thought uh, I, we had assumed he was going into real estate. I don't really know, you know he, where uh, he where his interest his interest moved from publishing into other things. Also, we we've had the impression, but I don't have any real information about this that a lot of the money he made in publishing 
was also because of the Captain Company. Oh, absolutely. That's where the money wow. came from. That's where the money In came a way, from. the comics, the three magazines were catalogs with the, you bought them for the comics, but you know, kids would or adults, but then there'd be a catalog in the back with like a million different things he would right. sell, right. like a you know, Wookiee mask or a you know, right. or a, a stormtrooper blaster or whatever was around, you know, monster masks from earlier before Star Wars. And the, the impression that we always had was that that's where the money really came from. I don't know if that's true. But he, he did the clever Disney esque thing of letting making people pay a dollar fifty for his catalogs. Yes, which I thought was just brilliant. You know, it's like you you that's a win win situation right oh, there. Yeah. And and I've paid money for catalogs myself, model car catalogs or or pop music catalogs, and mm-hmm. I've saved them, and some of them are worth quite a lot of money. Oh yeah, so you're, they you're are. still in contact with him. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. It occurs to me we should try and interview him. Oh, <laughs> that would be wonderful. I would be, you know, let me let me drop him a note. I don't have an email oh. for him, but I'll drop him a note and see if he'd be interested. That'd be great. And and I presume if I hear back from him, maybe well maybe I won't. We'd be happy to I, put him in I touch. Think he's probably That'd be wonderful. Right he's got to be in his mid nineties by now. Yeah, um, thereabouts. But he it's, seems completely sharp when he when we write. And notes the letters we get so. from him, he wrote. I had a I had a couple of years where I didn't get Christmas cards out. I, I had one year where uh, I just I was just slammed with work. I mean, I got them out. I got them out every year just to uh, some friends. And Christmas cards are his job. And they're my job, not <laughs> Weezy's job. So don't go out. It's not Weezy's fault. And so. <laughs> I, but I had a year where I didn't get them out. The, the break and Christmas and Thanksgiving wasn't very long. And I just had slam of work and I didn't do it. It was the first time in decades. And I just, I kept thinking, oh, I'll, I'll get them out at the last minute or I'll get them out right after Christmas. And eventually I just said, oh, screw it. And I just didn't do it. And, you know, it was kind of a relief, actually. <laughs> and then the next year was like our big COVID shutdown a couple of years ago. Yeah. And it, I wasn't really depressed by COVID. I mean, not the way a lot of people were. But it just kind of lay on everything. And so I just didn't do it again. And eventually I got a we got a cards from more in those two years. And I got, I got a nice little note from Jim saying, Hey, where's my card? <laughs> more or less. And so I I wrote him back and then we knew when his birthday was. I don't remember when it was now. And so I I, I did a little drawing, really by way of an apology for not keeping in touch, <laughs> and sent it back when he was really delighted with the yeah, drawing. He's, so he's a, he, he's so <laughs> I, I gotta tell you, when I first got into comics in 72. If you had said, oh, yeah, you'll be friends with and sending Christmas cards to Jim Warren by the time you're an old man, I would never have believed you. Should, you. you should tell them the story about your, your interview with Jim Warren, your first oh. <laughs> meeting with Jim Warren. Like, everybody has a first meeting story. I bet you've got yeah. I to hear about your interview. I will say mostly, mostly I do not remember when I meet people, like the first time I meet anybody. I do remember flying back in the airplane with Mike, and he was sitting next to me. We were shooting the breeze. But mostly... Like good friends of mine, I have no idea. I just know it's about here, but I don't really remember. In Jim's case, um, I was at art school, the Rhode Island School of Design. I was getting interested in comics. I mean, I read them when I was in college. I went to college twice. I liked college so much, I went back. And I read college the first time. I mean, read comics. That was when Marvel was really hot, mid-60s. And then by the time I was in art school, I'd begun to become interested in drawing them and trying my hand at them. And so I did a... 25 page or 26 page comic of Thor, Marvel's Thor that I, I inked. Uh, it wasn't the whole thing because by the time I got about 25 pages into it, I didn't like my inking and I thought I'm going to have to learn to ink better before I finish this. Mm-hmm. And that was the time before I knew anything about whiteout or anything about crow quill pens or brushes. It's all rapidograph. And that means it's on Asgard. There's a million stars up in the sky. So the stars are all a number two rapidograph where you draw little circles, bigger and smaller. And then you get a number four rapidograph and you fill in all the sky in the panel with a number four rapidograph. I mean, just insane. But I didn't know any better. So I had that comic and I went to New York. It was in a sketch. It was in a, a bound sketchbook. And I how went, old were you at this point? I would have been, that was what my, I was a sophomore so I'd already been to school. So I went to when I went to RISD, I was 21, probably 22 or thereabouts. And I took it to New York. Uh, and that was at a time when you could show up in an office and they would frequently just let you come in. Right. Not yeah. so much now. And so I went to the Warren office, which at the time I got went to DC. 
I met Lynn and Marv. Uh, I met Neil. Uh, Sal Amendola was assigned to take me around and show me stuff. I didn't have any appointment. I just, they said, oh yeah, say I'll show this kid around. So uh, Murphy Anderson was there inking. I, I'm kind of remembering Murphy was inking in a tie and a vest and a jacket. I don't know if that's true or if I'm just, but back then it was not as casual as it would be now. So, and Murphy probably could do that and get away with it. So I did eventually go to Warren. I don't think I went to Marvel and I went down, they were on 42nd street and it was, I'd never seen an arrangement like this before. I got out of the elevator and went up to whatever floor, fifth floor, sixth floor, third floor, whatever it was. And the door opened and you were in the room. Like it wasn't the hallway with doors off, but it was just like a New York loft where you walked in and there you were. And there was a guy named Chuck McNaughton who was the Warren's assistant who was working there at the time and introduced myself. And eventually uh, he showed me into Warren. Had, had, Warren had my book and he'd looked at it and he kind of read me the riot act. I don't remember much about what was actually said, but at the end of it, you know, kind of took me over the cold, read me over the you know, badly and then said, essentially, we'll send you a script. I thought, wow. So I walked out of there going, holy cow, really? I got back to RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, got back there, and one day a script showed up. Now, he's not alive anymore, so I will say this, but it was a script by Gardner Fox. And I had read some Gardner Fox at D.C. He was not my favorite writer. I have a broader view of that now than I had at the time, but I, I kind of went, holy cow, Gardner Fox, really? And I thought, I'm doomed. And what I got it was a six-page story, monster story, and on the side of the, of the script for each page, there was a little box with smaller boxes inside, the layouts for the essentially the panel breakdowns for each page. Now, nothing was inside them, but I followed those. I said, okay, a big panel, then two small ones, a big one here. I use those as my guides for my layouts. I didn't know any better, and I wouldn't have thought to just throw them out and do my own version. I sent, and I penciled it. They didn't want me to ink it. We're going to get some guy, another guy, uh, a guy who I did not know, but I knew I knew his work. Um, and they were going to get him to ink it. Uh, he was like me, a new guy in the biz. And I sent it in. And after a while, I got it back with a rejection notice. I got a nice note from Chuck McNaughton, which said what they'd really been looking for. These like wild layouts that I'd had in the Thor comic I'd shown them. <laughs> and I thought, then why the fuck send me these little drawings that I'm supposed to be following? Uh, those might have been Gardner Fox's little drawings yep. um, in order for him to figure out how to pace it. I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, I have to say, I was not, I'm not ungrateful that my first job in comics was not a Gardner Fox story. Just at least that's how I felt about it at the time. So I have a broader view of Gardner's work now than I had then. But um, but I still have the six pages floating around. Now, anybody out there who's on my Facebook pages, I have one, the official Walter Simonson page. If you go into there's a gallery of old stuff, which goes back to when I was about in third grade and runs up into the mid-70s. And somewhere in there, I have at least one of the pencil pages. And I will say, they're not great. I'd probably have turned them down too. Or I'd have given them to someone like Jack Davis to ink. And then they would, or Wally Wood, and then they would have looked fine. <laughs> nice. But that was my, oh, the other thing that Warren told me. That, yeah, I was that's right. That, that, was, that, was, that was really the best part. Thank thinking. you. Which was that because he was taking his valuable time to look at my work, and it was interrupting his day. He was going to pay me less than their ordinary page rate because that would sort of Compens uh, compensate him yeah. for his own time. <laughs> and I was green enough not to say, listen, asshole, your job, one of them is to be an art director and look at stuff. So don't give me any crap about taking money out of my pocket. But, yeah. you know, I wouldn't have, even if I thought of that, I wouldn't have said it at the time since I had no, I had no leverage, but I did think it was very funny. And I was, I was kind of crabby about it at the time. Now I just think it's funny. I know. Yeah. I just yeah. think, oh, Jim Warren. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it, it becomes an anecdote. It becomes an anecdote. I can dine out in that story from time to time. So, Weezy, how much work did you do for Warren? Oh, gosh. I get, I was, I think I was there six years. Walter knows how long I was six someplace. Years. Yeah, okay. He, he's my timekeeper. Um, I was an assistant for a couple of years 
and the years. editor in chief there for four. four years after that. Yep. And you wrote a couple stories. Oh, I did. Or yeah, one or two. Not many. Is that where you started writing fiction? Um, yeah, I did. I didn't I didn't use my name when I was at Warren. And I didn't pay myself for them. They were things that I could just sort of slip in when things didn't come through because I, it's, I think I used Alex Southern as the name. Um, what I, I didn't think it was right to take money as a writer. If I was an, if I was the editor, it just didn't seem right for me to hire myself, which is crazy actually now because Bill DeBay did, did that all the time. I don't know where this how this got into my head, but it did. Well, you didn't have a modern so, yeah, I did a couple outlook of, on I did a couple of stories yeah. there. I did a story about um uh gene splicing critters to do underwater mining. I don't know. I just I love gene splicing stories. You know, where you got you got they're part human, they're part animal, and they are they're created to do a task. And I don't know, for some reason that always grabs me. So I did a story about that. And I don't I think I did a time travel story. Maybe so. You and also, I will say this about Weezy. The movie Splice. We haven't seen that. I haven't seen I'm that. not sure I want to see that one, <laughs> frankly. But uh, I will say the other thing about it that Weezy didn't say quite this way is that she also felt that it was unfair for her as an editor who had a regular job to take money out of the hands of freelancers who might otherwise be writing the story that took up the six or eight pages that she was I mean, filling. That was why it took me a long her own time to, to start doing work writing at Marvel was that I didn't shoot or wanted all of his editors to do freelance work as well. I think to see which, to see what it's like on the other side of the desk. And um, I didn't want to write something there just because I had a lot of writers who worked for me and I knew they were feeding their families by writing. And if I grabbed one of right. their books, well then, you know, they're out the money. And um but then she'd hired a batch of new editors and I got bored. So I thought of. Because what, what that meant was her workload was cut in it, half. Yes. And it yeah. was like to do the work fine. And they had a ton. She had a ton of books. Back then, editors had lots of books. Weezy could breeze through them. Yeah, I, I was. Well, that's because I hired people who knew what they were doing and were really good. And I liked It's because work. Weezy was really good. No, no, let's no, no, not, no, no. Let's was, not get was, ourselves. Books. I was good at picking people whose work was good. Well, that's an important function, maybe the most important function of a good editor. <laughs> Probably so. Yeah. Anyway. But you could keep track of all of it. I, well, I could. It's what you could. Sometimes. Yeah. Except for the cover that you did for me. But that's well. another story. Um, <laughs> Uh-oh. No, no, it's, that, that's just a funny one. Um, but so I, I, when there were, when, I'm, when my work had been cut in half and I was bored, I sort of thought about make, creating a comic about little kids who were superheroes. And I told Shooter, I said, well, I have this idea. So maybe a mini or whatever. Um, poor little kids who are superheroes, their siblings and blah, blah, blah. And he said, okay, well, write it up. I Maybe we can get a mini series out of it. We'll see. He would, did not have faith. I could see that. I, it was a crazy idea. <laughs> and um, I, so I wrote it up. And then June Brickman came into my office. And you know, I, a lot of people can't draw kids, but it turned out that June actually could. She yeah. had spent some time at Six Flags when she was a kid doing, you know, the portraits and, you know, oh, for those people. Yeah. So, I mean, she'd drawn a lot of, you know, people, grown-ups and kids and everything. So um, I, I handed her the script and I said, draw the kids. And if I like what you've drawn, then I'll hand, the, hand us to shoot, shoot her together as a team. I mean, she literally, yeah, came, into the office. Back, right? she literally yeah. came into the office the day Weezy had this yeah, 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 yeah. thing. It was just complete coincidence. Wow. But that was the day June showed up. Yeah. And um, so she took it home and she did these gorgeous little drawings. Yeah. And I, you know, staple learned by, <laughs> you know, by, by my treatment, I guess you'd call it, and uh, had it to Shooter. And several days later, Shooter came back and he said, okay, you've got yourself a regular series. The first issue is a double size issue. <laughs> and you, I think it's due in two months. It might have been three months. Anyway, June had never drawn a comic before. And uh, I had never written a full long comic before. But, you know, we, we managed it. And that was, that was, you know, uh, that's my, I don't know. Even you're talking I'm about power pack, story. right? Cost right into the deep <laughs> end yeah. of the school. What's that? Pa power pack, right? Power pack. Yes, power pack. That's power right. Pack. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, June came back with the kids drawn in their costumes. 
And the little uh, logos nice. on their chests. So actually, very she, cool. She hadn't drawn the costume. Oh, she hadn't drawn. I thought she had no, drawn. No, no, no. We kids. designed those later. It was the kids. Oh, and she, you okay. Know, and, and she drew them in character, like you know, Jack, who's our. Oh, that's right. Jack, who's our little grumpy kid, had his arms folded, his lips poked out, and you know, Katie was you know being her usual little cute, kid, cute little kid self, and I think Julie had a book, and Alex had braces. She had one of those. Things with oh, wow, nice. So it was just, it was just cute, and Shooter loved yeah. it, which was really nice, you know. Because honestly, you've got to give the guy credit because that was a really a crazy idea. But it worked out. But it worked, it, he liked it, so it was a good comic. And I guess everybody else, a lot of other people liked it too. So that's yeah. of the books that we've done. Of the books we've done, that's probably the book that has the most sustained fandom. People now that oh, book's no, like that's th not true because Thor. You well, Thor is okay, but I, but but. <laughs> there are power pack fanatics out there. There are power pack fanatics who are. And I'm sure you'd fans. have no trouble doing a revival. Well, yeah, we're we're, we're doing a five issue mini series right now. Oh, cool. So you know, every once in a while, they you know yeah. <laughs> pull it out. And they come back and, and they unearth the old guys yeah. and bring them back and, and put them back up and in tell the old them. in the old continuity where the kids have grown up in Marvel. Now, oh wow, but, yeah, um, yeah. my stories are set back in the old continuity. There's, you know, part the the time that it tells the story of what happened, you know, before they started, you know, they're becoming, you know, relatively grown up. The characters, characters. They are now. I was talking about doing comics on a on a long term basis. I mean, it's true in books and series, serial books as well, like detective stories, where you have to kind of wrestle with the problem that time goes by. So should you age your characters right. or do they right. stay kind of, I mean, uh, Robert B. Parker did the Spencer novels. You know, they, there's an acknowledgement that Spencer's older in more recent book. Well, he's no longer writing because he's dead, but it, there's, it, it got older in the books, but it never affected how they behaved or anything else. It just meant when they used guns, they went from whatever they had in the old days to Sig Sauer's and Glocks now. So some of that stuff changed, yeah. but the essential characters didn't change much. And in comics, that's kind of how it works. I mean, goodness knows, Franklin Richards has been any number of ages <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> so that is kind of a problem that you, if you're on a book long enough or if a character's run long enough, some people address it, some don't. Um, I don't care myself. I'm not I'm not wedded to the idea, oh, it's been 10 years. This guy has to be 10 years older. It's a comic book. Relax. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Gas Alley in the newspaper strips. People grew up and I you know, know that's what made it an unusual strip. And, uh, also, um, uh, for better or for worse, by Lynn Johnston, uh, the characters in that age as they went along, the kids grew up as they went, she went along in that. So there are different ways to tackle didn't, that problem. Didn't John Burns say it's like seven. He thinks that it's seven human years to a comic book year. That's funny. Oh, there is. Yeah, there was some. Yeah. Yeah, I would analyze it like yeah, that. I That's, I, yeah, I would, I would never even occur to me to analyze it in that sense. But uh, yeah, there was something. That works. I'm sure he Whatever. has some formula for the work. <laughs> like dog years. Dog years, yeah. <laughs> Novelists do that more frequently than comic book creators because I think one of the reasons is that uh, the comic book, the your readership is constantly turning over and uh, the people are familiar with the characters at a certain age. But, you know, a, a lot of writers were inspired by John D. McDonald, as was I. And mm. his uh, Travis McGee character got older as he went along. And then on the last one, in the last one, The Lonely Silver Rain, he learned that he had a daughter out of wedlock who, who came to live with him. And that kind of put a cap on it. You know, I don't know. I read all. I love the Travis McGee stuff. I read it a million years ago when it was coming out, more or less. I don't know if I've read that one. Um, I really, I, now I'm going to have to go, if we get done here, I'm going to have to go look, I'll pull up Johnny McDonald, pull out his stuff and get a good look at it, but I enjoy his work. I don't know in my case that it would be influential, especially, I was probably reading it really before I thought about comics, but, um, but I did, I remember Denny O'Neill wrote an essay once about those kind of books and he regarded the Travis McGee work as the Taj Mahal. That was I like, did too. that was like the pinnacle of that kind of writing. I and agree. that kind of series. And there it, are I, so I, many I, series yeah. today that are that are inspired by that. Like there's a guy named Randy Wayne White, who's a marine biologist that lives in Florida, who's got a character called uh, Doc Ford. Uh, and uh, Randy Wayne White, when he was 20 years old, he wanted to be a writer. He and a friend took a boat and 
and beached it on McDonald's beachfront property. And they didn't know the guy from Adam and said, hey, Mr. McDonald, we're big fans of yours. We want to be writers. He took them in and he showed them around. They, they had a long afternoon. Wow. And now Ron, Randy Wayne White is turning out novels that are in that mode, although his character is very distinctive. And no one would confuse him with McDonald. But I recommend right. those books. Good for yeah. him. And good for McDonald for taking him in and oh, yeah, that, showing that, him around. That was terrific. It was, must have been transforming for him. Yeah, yeah, I bet it was transformative for sure. I, I wanted. To, I just. I'm just curious. Um, where did the uh, horse-like alien come from for, <laughs> power, for Power Pack? Uh, June likes horses. I, 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 I was wondering. She does. She does. She, she owns a horse. Um, she's a. But the they're actually seahorses. They're they're seahorse like aliens more than right. horse like aliens. Well, they right they little hooves and yeah yeah no, yeah. That's just but that was inspiration. Um, I had thought for some reason I was thinking rabbits. I'm I, I'm not exactly a big Alice in Wonderland fan, but I'm very imp I was very imprinted by Alice in Wonderland. I was one of the first books that I can remember being having read to me. I mean, I was my I was three. And my grandmother read it to me. And it is so weird. I mean, obviously, it sunk deep into my psychic, into yeah. my psyche, so that I, you know, I tend to, I, th I go to Alice in Wonderland before I go to anything else, even when I don't realize I've done it until like years later, I think, oh, gee, well, there you go. That's where I got that idea. Um, so I had thought that the, the, the the aliens were white, as in, you know, shining white, but oh. I had thought they would be rabbits. But I didn't tell June what they would like, look like because, or what I thought they'd look like because it's, I'm not the guy, the person in charge of that. I trusted her to come up with something really cool. And what she came up was bet, which with, was yeah. much better than, yeah. um, mm -hmm. than, than, than uh, bunny rabbits for God's sakes. I don't know what I would have been thinking, but anyway, so that's, that, that was, you know, just, she was, she drew something. She, she loved drawing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you could tell. You could tell. I, I did. I wanted to ask um, Walt too. I, I'm interested in your some of your art style choices with the like some of your um, explosions and things. Like they om they almost look like Art Deco or something. Like this the style of the. Um, I'm just wondering where you came up with. I mean, I can see some of the stuff with the way that Kirby and some other people did things, but I'm just wondering because that was like you're saying it. That's very much. Uh, part of your style with making it exciting and, and things like that and with all the extra kind of lines and energy and everything but i'm just wondering where like because you did that a lot with a lot of the circles and a lot of the and a, a lot of explosions and, and I, I don't know i was just wondering where, where that came from i like circles i, <laughs> yeah. I use them a lot um i think partly i don't know about art deco I, mean, I like art deco uh probably some of the stuff that i've done over the years Many years ago now, this is like 30 years ago or more, we were still in the city, uh, yeah. probably came out of, of uh, Russian constructivism. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of some of that work. Uh, I had an early a book from many years ago that had a lot of the movie posters from the constructivist era. Um, I went and I took a short course at the, oh man, I'm going to say the Whitney, but I'm not sure it was the Whitney. It was one somewhere up on the east side of Manhattan, and they had a little evening course on uh, Russian on constructivism, Russian constructivism, and which included uh, a brief performance, a fragment of a performance, three or four performers from some Russian constructivist play, and they really applied that the ideals of that stuff to all sorts of uh, different artistic endeavors, and that was pretty cool. I don't remember much about it now, but I did like the way they sort of the photo montage, the way that stuff worked out, and just the design elements. And so I tried. I sort of incorporated some of that into my work, yeah. um, but mostly, well, a lot of Kirby. Obviously, I'm a big, I'm a big Kirby Crackle fan. I use a lot of Kirby Crackle. Yeah, yeah, yep. But I also, you know, I want the, I don't know, I want the explosions to be, I don't, it, to be something. I don't want them just to be kind of random crap on a page or whatever. Right. I want them to have their own life. I mean, in a way, it's almost like doing abstract art. Um, I'm not yeah. a giant abstract art fan per se, but, but when you create those, I mean, that, on the one hand, it is a storytelling thing. So it's not really abstract. It's right. got meaning in terms of the story, but it's also something where I want the page design, uh, to be effective. 
Um, the one time I did something didn't work out. It worked out okay, but it was it was not what I intended to do. Yeah. Um, I did the adaptation, the drew the adaptation for Alien, the the original movie. And uh, at the end, of the, Archie wrote it. The adaptation at the end of the adaptation, about four or five pages from the end. This one, this is a spoiler or a warning for anybody who hasn't seen Alien. You can turn the sound down now. But uh, there's an explosion. I'll just say that there's a giant explosion. And my original idea, and I I inked the page like this, was I put two concentric circles. They were off center, so they were cropped a little on one side. I like asymmetry, and I filled in the, between the two of them with black. So they were about an inch and a half thick, or this giant circle was. And my original plan was to take white out and a brush and draw a series of lines in white out. So it would radiate out through the an equal amount of white and black and white and black and white and black. And somewhere along there, I realized, I'll take the next year getting this done. That's just not going to... And, and you I, had about two minutes. I had about two minutes finished. to do that job. I had a job. I got that whole thing done in under five months in the last third. In... That was the one. I was working at Warren and coming home yes, and coloring comics at night. That's right. And taking pages in and getting them in zero. Was I, what, zero, was I zero? At Warren? Them? I didn't, oh, I, if I did, I would have paid Warren for it. Yeah, I don't remember that. Or whatever it was. But it was, some, no, get, it was someplace else I took them We're going to get photostats of them to get the color. Was that it? I don't remember well, how we That might that. have been it. We got photostats. We shrank the page down a little bit, bigger than printed else. size, but smaller than the originals. And that way we could we mounted right. those on chips. Well, actually, we, we paid my, our daughter and one of her friends to rubber cement all these photostats down on chipboard, on cardboard, so they wouldn't buckle. And then those were, we, I, I discovered very early on, I wasn't going to be able to color the whole thing. I didn't time. I colored the first eight pages, yeah. and then I could see it wasn't going to work out. So I hired Wheezy and Polly Law, who worked up Continuity, and a good friend of ours, Deb Pedler, who was out of uh, Pratt. And they did all the coloring from then on and the rest of it. And the color was, it was Dr. Martin's dyes, and it was just laid down on top of the photostats. Oh. So those became the originals that were actually photographed for the book. But uh, anyway, this explosion, I said, this is just not going to, I can't do it. It's going to take too long to do it. So I had a little airbrush that I used for building model kits, so putting camouflage schemes on Spitfires and stuff. And so I just used that and I just airbrushed an explosion, <laughs> which I've never done before or since. And if you look at the printed version, if you look really closely, because it was done, I did it over the photostat of this black circle. If you look really closely, you can see a little bit of green coming through the explosion <laughs> where the black was. You have to know it's there. You'd never notice otherwise. Yeah. And that would come out that way. And the, the funniest part about that was over in Spain, they, did, they printed this in a lot of different countries. And they printed it in Spain. But in Spain, they printed it in black and white. They used the black and white films for the for the comic, not the color. And the result is that explosion. Here's this giant, it's a big donut of black. That's all it is. It doesn't oh, wow. have any blast lines. It doesn't have anything to indicate. You're going, why is this donut here in the <laughs> middle of this story? <laughs> Do you still oh. model? What's that? Do you still model? I haven't for a long time. I I, I did a lot in high school, a little after that. Um, I was really, as a modeler, I was really into World War II single-seat fighters. Actually, you got um, some up there. I, well, those are, those are snap togethers. Yeah, I have a, I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> In the top of the studio, which maybe. So there's an ME109 and, oh, let me see. It must, oh, it's over here. Pursuing it is a P51. Wow. And they were they were big things that, that uh, Toys R Us sold many years ago. Uh, they were just, they're snapped together. They're about four pieces. You snap the wings on the few. But they're really nice. They're pretty accurate, as far as I can yeah, tell. Yeah, they're actually fine um, using as reference. And so I hung them up on the out of my ceiling here and just have a a perpetual dogfight over my head. So, um, so I haven't really built models. I when I, I did do some, depending on the book I was doing. When I did Battlestar Galactica uh, many years ago, I I drew it, and eventually I drew and wrote. I wrote and drew it. Oh, you know, let me get you back in here, no. please. Oh. Sorry about that. Hi. So I uh, I went out and bought all the models I could find. They had a Viper. They had the Galactica, they had a Cylon base star. Oh, and they had one of the, uh, whatever the Cylon fighter planes were called, whatever the name of those things were. And so I bought all the kits, threw them together. Uh, the Viper I actually spent a little time on and, and painted it and decaled it. The others I just mostly spray painted one color so I could see the light and the dark on them when I was would put light on them for uh, effect. And uh, 
I did that a couple of times. I didn't build any of the Star Wars models much, no. but I did, you know, I bought as many toys as I, you know, you could get the Millennium Falcon. You right. could get all that stuff. So I bought a, a number of those toys. I had a real nice R2-D2 that was about so high. I have no idea what became of it. No longer around as far as I can tell. But uh, but a lot of that stuff, I will say the, the Lucas people were pretty accurate. I, I, I gather they were probably pretty careful about what came out under their over their name or their name. So they were accurate enough. Although I Those just, days saw, are gone. <laughs> I just saw a post on probably on my page. I put up a page um, that showed, what was this in the millennium Falcon? Well, or somebody posted it. Al Williamson's uh, page, I think from star Wars 50, the Marvel comic 50, and it's the millennium Falcon flying toward the viewer. And some guy notes, Oh, clearly he was using the, the, the Kepler. Yeah. <laughs> Zonaplex model of the. I I don't have I don't have any new I don't have any idea. Al collected <laughs> all that stuff. He had he was a fanatic for getting that and the action figures and everything. So we did the you know the newspaper strip and, then, and other stuff. When you did it, Tom Palmer was your ink. That's right, Tom inked it. And Tommy, his his son, was such a fanatic. He was like six or seven years old at that point. He was crazy. He's such a fanatic. He would sit beside his dad and make sure his dad got. Everything drawn just the way it ought to be drawn. Yeah, if you screwed up the Millennium Falcon, Tommy would let him know. <laughs> oh. And today, Tommy is an editor somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Right? yes, yes, yes. Uh, he did. He, he actually work, was an editor for a while. He worked has at his DC. Own company now. He may have his own. He does maybe web stuff now. Yeah. But he he was on his dad to uh, make sure that stuff was accurate. Yeah. And we tried, you know, within the confines of doing a monthly comic book, we tried to get all that stuff as correct as we could. Um, yeah, and so we had all the models and. All that stuff. It was fun. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you working on now? Okay. I, I just finished the Power Pack uh, miniseries, and I'm I I just did a a, a, a three page story with June for the oh uh, yeah the what was it what was it called Scott Doombear is putting together uh, through uh, Zoop through one of the crowdfunding uh, companies right. uh, a sunflower how many pages? seeds it's called sunflower seeds that is a a comic designed to raise money for Ukrainian, Ukrainian refugees. And Ukrainian refugees. So he's so got. You're, you're telling me there's a new Power Pack comic in the works with June Brigman? Oh, yeah. It's, 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 it's a five part miniseries. It's done. Oh. So it'll be coming out. Yeah, June has a couple of panels posted on her page every once in a while. Yeah. You know, I guess cool. mostly Marvel doesn't like it when you do that kind of thing. Yeah. But they're pencils. Yeah, I've, I've had people, I've had guys at companies explain, oh, we don't want this stuff to come out first because uh, we want to be able to release it at the right time. And yeah, my own feeling really is you're going to have to really convince me it's not going to affect sales if I put a picture of a cover I've done up before Marvel releases the Imager DC. I mean, I don't do it. I don't want to bite the hand that feeds me. But I also figure, really, you're going to lose sales because I posted some. My right. feeling is Walt Simonson fans are all going to go, Quick, run to the comic store and order right. this comic book now yep. in case he, they miss the you know, the announcement that Marvel makes it. So I, I don't really believe that, but we do have a theory. This was Wheezy's theory. I won't go. I won't be specific. Which was that a lot of stuff companies do is not so much about creative endeavor; it's about control. Yeah, that the product they manufacture is largely controlled. And comics are secondary. It's but manifested I have, through comics. Yeah, manifested through comics. And I have to say, as I watch things happening around America, I kind of feel the same thing is true for a chunk of America, where it's really about control. It's not about other stuff. But I'm not going to go there any further than that. That's just, I just hadn't thought about that before. But there is a certain element of control that I don't know really has any effect on the sales. I mean, sales departments kind of like to run stuff. They kind of like to tell you what they want done. And I'm not convinced that makes the best comics. Yeah. Like, or even the ones that sell the best. But I think for that, you have to have a lot of freedom, a really freedom to fail because not everything you're going to do is going to work really well. Right. Um, but occasionally Sometimes it takes a while for things to catch on. Absolutely. And by the time people have noticed, noticing that they're good, they've pulled them. Yeah. Much of my work, I like 20 years after I've done it, people go back and say, you know, this Orion stuff wasn't too bad. The, 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 that was a genius job. <laughs> Yeah. Why did you quit doing it, Will? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm doing a Superman thing too, a Superman story with John Bogdanov. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, so yeah. I'm drawing an eight-page story for the Ukraine book 
of the Star Slammers, which are characters I invented. Oh, cool, yeah. I remember the Star Slammers. I'm doing a star, a new Star Slammers story for that with old Rojas, the character I did in the uh, five right. miniseries. So that'll be in that book. And then uh, I we just did, well, over the last year and a half, three issues uh, for Marvel, two of X Factor and oh, one of the right. New Mutants. They did yeah. all come out, but they were, Wheezy wrote them and she set them back in her old continuity. Yeah, that was right. the that and, was the 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 I don't know what they what they wanted to do. Apparently, right. That sort of thing sells. Yeah, we we have no idea about the business model of comics we anymore. Just, we just we don't have, have a do clue. As we're told. So. That's right. The check clears. I'm good. <laughs> so yeah. I did just and and actually the the New Mutants job was very helpful to me because I've never drawn the New Mutants before, at least not as a book. I've done individual ones in X Factor and places like that. Right. So it was all New Mutants. It was a lot of characters. It was like a miniature X-Men Teen Titans book in 20 pages <laughs> instead of in 60. It wrote a billion characters. So right. Wheezy researched all that stuff for me. She found all the co- – and, of course, they changed costumes all the time. So she had to find – this was set in a particular place in her continuity. So right. she had to, she found all the costumes for me. And I got one of those accordion folders, like 18 uh, right. envelope, you know, pockets. And we just filled it with – stuff we print off from the web of all these characters and their outfits so I could more or less keep them straight because I couldn't remember them all. And that one, for whatever reason, I decided because I, you know, I don't do this much. I didn't, never did it before. Um, I decided to ink it with marker instead of with pen and, and brush. I mean, I know a lot of kids do that. I say kids, not all of them are children, but they're all kids to me. Right. <laughs> so a lot of them use that stuff. Uh, Copix and uh, uh, you know, the brand I always use, I can never remember the name of the Christmas? damn thing. What? It's Prisma something? I no, think. no, it's it, uh, Pigma. Pigma yeah, markers, yeah. and there's some other name as well. Anyway, um, so I the the stock at, at uh, not Marshalls, what's Michaels? The Michaels craft store stock went yeah. up like forty percent one month because I bought like eight billion dollars worth of markers, and I, I didn't know which ones were any good, so I brought them all home, tried them out, and the one whose name I cannot remember. I'm to look. I can't. I'm too embarrassed. Oh, well, don't they fade after a while? Well. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, the answer is yes, they used to. Uh, I've got a, you know, I've seen Alex Toth pages or give, where the markers have turned red and the black line has become red and it's fading away. Yeah, in fact, we have um, a, a little a drawing upstairs. I have a drawing it's upstairs. It's, a, almost, a, it's, it's almost gone. Now. It's almost gone from Alex. That was for for my tour, a TV thing, uh, one of the TV shows he did. Yeah. It's a pterodactyl flying, and it's gradually flying into the distance by fading out <laughs> quietly on the paper. Um, but uh, most of the pens now have a little it says archival along the side. Oh. Now, I don't know if I believe that. So see me again in ten and it's years. It's like the fine archival, really. Yeah, and so yeah. I don't know if that's really true or not. I they claim to be. I'll find out eventually. But um, but I had a lot of fun doing it, drawing with a marker like that. Is a lot more like sketching than using a croquoil pen or even a brush. There's a freedom of it. You know, you don't keep dipping your pen or your brush. You just kind of keep going. Um, they don't last all that long, which is the reason I bought five million of them, so I, I could just throw them out and get to the next one. Um, and then this is the where I'm leading with the jobs I've done. Just recently, I did an eight-page story, I guess. They're doing. They just had a Thor 24 came out, which was its whole number 700. Yeah. They did a big issue with it. They got Jason Aaron to do a story, and I think uh, Dan Jurgens did a story. I think I haven't seen the comic yet. It has come out. JR, I think, did a story. Uh, Drew, Dan, maybe Dan's story. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, forgotten who else is in it. And they asked me to do a an eight page Beta Red Bill story. And so I I haven't done Bill in 35 years or thereabouts. A little, yeah, that's about right. And so. Uh, I come up with an idea, and again, I, I fit it into my old continuity because a lot has happened to Bill since I left the character, and I haven't followed a lot of that. And I don't want to go back and spend all the time researching it to do eight pages worth of stories. It was easier yeah. to go back and just do a something that fit. And so I did kind of a, I enlarged on his origin somewhat. So he never shows up in the kind of Thor costume I gave him originally. They've gotten rid of that anyway, but he shows up in the armor I gave him in the first panel you see him in. And I did the, did the layouts, and the way I normally work, I'll do the layouts, I'll put tracing paper over it, I'll indicate where all the balloons, the lettering go, I'll ship those off to John with a script, John Workman with a script. Um, he'll letter everything, 
and he'll put all the panel borders in and the trim lines around the outside and all the balloon borders and everything. It'll come back to me and then I will pencil it. I'll tighten it up at that point because that way, if I have a, I have a little loose, I'll have like little, you know, uh, circles and dots and uh, for eyes and not quite stick figures, but very much like that. Just so he has some idea of what's going on in the panel. When I get it back, if I discover I've got a balloon that covers somebody's head because I didn't guess right about the amount of space, right. I can redraw it, you know, with that light pencil. Right. You know, if you erase it, you don't care. So I think all, all the best pencilers it. put in the word balloons. I think it's essential because if you leave it to the letterer, they're going to. You know, it depends on the letterer or the, yeah, or the yeah, writer. Course, so <clears throat> I get it back. Well, actually, I sent it off to John. I get a call from John the next day. It's on Strathmore 500, which is generally really good paper. I've used it since I was in the business. And he he says, I tried laying down a line for a panel border, and the ink just beat it up as if the surface of the paper had a resist on it. Hmm. And so you have to lay it down three or four times to get it to lay down. And that means lettering. It's going to be just a complete pain in the ass. Yeah. So we discussed what to do about that. And one of the thoughts was, well, the layouts are done. I could scan them all and then print them off in blue line on good paper, paper I've tested, and send them back to John. And then I thought, you know, I just did this job in marker. I said, how about marker? Have you tried that? And John said, no, he hadn't tried that. And he had markers. So... He tried it. He came back and he says, this paper takes marker as though it were designed for marker. And I said, great. So he lettered everything in marker and I inked everything in marker. So having done this earlier job and kind of gotten used to it, I was able to breeze right through the, the eight pages of Beta Ray Bill and get that done. And uh, it was fun. And we did discover that those those pens are great for filling in blacks. Oh, yeah, man, they're fabulous. And I end up filling in blacks when you get really late. Yep, this is my beautiful female assistant because, right here. Oh, you know, I've got helps now. Out. What can I say? And um, I love, I, it's so much easier with these markers than it oh, is. Oh, yeah. That's oh, like gosh. a brush marker with a very fat, you know, flexible. Yeah, yeah the yeah. types of markers tend to go every which way. So, or, I mean, and brushes. brushes do. So. so, we're hoping it doesn't turn red in 10 years, but at least the job's in print. So, and if it does, yeah, well. If it does, so what? <laughs> So, uh, and I have to go look. Let me slip behind you for a second. I, I'm, it's for some reason, oh, sorry, sorry. this name never sticks in my brain. Oh, I did use Tombow markers as well. Tombow markers. Tombow, which were good. Microns. 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 Must remember the name Micron. That's, uh, those are the ones I, I found most amenable to the way I work. So I used Microns. And Tombows were good. The Tombow came with a plastic point. They had two of them, one a little harder point, one a little softer, she had a little extra line variation in it. And I found those to be very helpful as well. So um, those are the two eventually I mostly relied on. You were telling us off air about um, Archie and uh, and Manhunter. Yep. And we should definitely have you at least share that before you before you leave okay. us. Okay. All right. Um, the story was... was What's that? <laughs> Enough time has passed since he first told it. So yeah. he can tell it fresh. Again. Maybe I can tell it fresh again. Um, <laughs> I, I did Manhunter since I was six months into my career when I started Manhunter, so a year and a half when I finished. It took about a year to do. There were seven chapters, that was correct. And uh, it'd been reprinted a couple times. And then DC wanted to go back in the 90s and reprint it again. And they wanted Archie and me to do a new Manhunter story. So the, And uh, we couldn't think of a story. Uh, the problem was we did not want to do a story that kind of fit in some weird place in the continuity to expand the space between two panels or whatever it would have been. And so nothing really developed. I mean, years went by while we were this was floating around. Uh, in the meantime, uh, or somewhere in there, Archie uh, developed uh, lymphoma. I think lymphoma is correct. Yeah, and uh, uh, he was ill and fighting it and then in remission and fighting it in remission for about eight years. And uh, one day he called me to his office. I was up at DC, just annoying editors as I tend to do. And he says, he's had an idea for a story. So I went in, we sat down and we did what we used to do at his apartment a million years ago when we were doing Manhunter, the later issues. First ones he did full script. Later we done Marvel style. And we talked about the plot. He gave me his idea <clears throat> and we talked it. Mostly he plotted, I kibitzed. 
Um, but we were able to work out an eight page story. The original chapters were pretty much all eight pages. So we wanted an eight page story and it was an epilogue to the original series. And it wouldn't involve, I mean, in the original series, spoiler alert, uh, Manhunter dies. And we did, weren't going to bring him back. But he had an idea for something that would be logical to happen after Manhunter was gone. And it included Batman, which was just cool. It's, it's cool to do Batman. So, And Batman's familiar with Manhunter because he and Manhunter appeared together in Manhunter's last story. So we talked it all out, got it ready. I went back to the plot. And I had other work I was doing, so I spent a couple of months. I drew a couple of covers that I, I didn't like, although I look at them now and I go, what is wrong with you? These look fine. But sometimes the stuff you do just doesn't look good to you right then. Uh, six months later, you're thinking, what was I thinking? So I had that stuff. I had a few other sketches and some other stuff. And then one day, uh, Paul Levitz, who was a pub, I guess, publisher at the time, or editor-in-chief, whatever Paul's rank was, an old friend I'd known since he was first at D.C., he called me up, I think on a Sunday, and he called to tell me that Archie had died, which I thought was very kind of Paul to let me know, just to call up like that. And I didn't learn about it in the web. I didn't find out about it from a friend. Well, I did find out about it from a friend, but not just kind of randomly out of the blue. Uh, and it was a shock because Archie had been so ill off and on. It wasn't really a surprise, but it was a shock. and. I just figured that was the end of Manhunter because that character to me, that particular version, it's, it's me and Archie. So I'm not going to write the dialogue. I don't, I'm not going to do a story. Somebody else is going to write the dialogue in. I'm done doing Manhunter. I thought, well, that's the end of that. And a couple of months later, I don't know, it came up somehow. We you know, were talking about it. And she said, well, could you do it as a silent story? And this is why my belief is I married the best editor in comics because I thought, Wow, I wouldn't have to put the words in, but I could tell the story. So I got a hold of DC, and DC said, I explained what I wanted to do, what, what I thought, the thought, and they said, yeah, we're game to do it. They gave it to Denny O'Neill to edit. Um, so I filled Denny, and he was completely hands-off. Um, and I did as a silent story. I found, I began doing thumbnails to start with, because I really had no idea how long it would take. I knew it would take longer than our original eight pages with no words. And I had it. There were a lot of things where I had to kind of do gestures and things that would carry the story that I wouldn't have done originally. I wouldn't have had to bother originally. And I, I must have redrawn the first four or five pages five times because I'd get started and I'd get into it. And then I could see it just the pacing. It just wasn't working out. And I'd throw it. I'd start again. And on about the fifth time or thereabouts, I got into it where I began to have it flow for me. And by the time I was done, I had 23 pages that covered the whole story. And uh, I, I did my own sound effects. I'd done my sound effects back originally. So I got to do them again. I was willing to letter, and I lettered those myself. I didn't give them to John. I wanted, since I'd done the originals, I wanted to letter them in this, in this job. And I used them to help tell the story in a few places. I felt I wasn't, I wasn't cheating too much on that. And uh, I got it all worked out. Um, and on that one, I don't remember. I, that might have been Klaus Jansen may have colored that. I'd have to go back and look now, but um, because he did color, he did color one of the reprints of Manhunter, and it may have been that one. Anyway, I uh, uh, was able to get it all worked out, and ultimately the book came out, and it came out with that story at the end, and it was kind of it was cyclical in that in the last panel, Commissioner Gordon and Batman are walking off panel and kind of walking away. You know, like Humphrey Bogart and Claude Rains at the end of Casablanca. And Commissioner Gordon kind of wants to know, what the hell's going on? What was all this about? And so what I did, since I have my original Manhunter pages, most of them still, um, I took the first page of Manhunter and I scanned it. Or maybe back then I Xeroxed it. I might be, that might be a Xerox days. And I pasted it into the last page. So that's actually the original Manhunter page there with Batman and, Man and Commissioner Gordon walking below it and Je Batman is gesturing. I don't know if I actually put a word balloon around that panel or just had it up the page or had it up there, but clearly, I hope it's clear, he's telling Commissioner Gordon the story of Manhunter, which is so the last page of that job 
is more or less the first page of the original series. Well, I'll tell you one more story if you got the time. Yeah. Sure. If you don't, it's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> this is about the cover for Wheezy. She mentioned uh -oh. the book. Come on. Yeah. Oh. Oh, that cover, Which that was, okay. Weez was handing a lot of books at the time. This would have been 82. Handing a lot of books. And except for this one instance I know about, she kept everything in order, everything in line. It was all in her head. Everything, you know, who had the pages. I did of, have charts. Well, it had charts. But who had pe pencils, who had inks, who had color, where the lettering was, all that stuff. Yeah, I could remember and, it back in the day. Lord, I couldn't remember it now. Oh, and at the time, <laughs> I had a studio. I was We were living on West 71st Street. Uh, just off Central Park West. And I had a studio with some friends of mine down on West 29th Street, between 7th and 8th Avenues. Well, at the time, what, 82, was probably Howard Chaikin, Frank Miller, Jim Sherman, and me. And I'm not sure Frank was in still at that time, but maybe. Anyway, so we, I, I went, you know, Weezy would get up in the morning and we'd get Julie off to school and she would, and, and then Weezy would head off to the office. I'd head down to uh, uh, the studio and frequently, when I'm at the studio, the first thing I would do is spend a couple hours reading a book. And then I would kind of get around to work. Howard would come in, Frank, would, they'd be at work on the desk that three seconds after they were in the door. But I'm lazier than they are. So I'd read a novel or I'd read part of a novel and I'd get to work. And I got in and I get a call from Wheezy. You want to explain this part? Or so? <laughs> and she had a Conan book. She had what, several books going out that day. One of them was an issue of Conan, and she had discovered she'd forgotten the commissioner cover for it. Yeah, it wasn't just that; it was that we were we we were using inventory, adapting inventory that w had been in the drawer for how who knows how long. We were to take a an old Tarzan story and turn it into a Conan story. You know, we just had this pile of. of stuff that used to be stories and we were supposed to make some other kind of story about, about it. So I think this was like, it was, I think it was a Tarzan story. I remember originally. that. I take your word for Back it. Back in the olden days. I did. I did a Tarzan story as a galactic. And, and I, so, and I, I said, I didn't get a cover for this. I totally I blanked on it. And you so said, she, what's in the story? That's right. She called me up and said, I need a cover. I need it today. And we were across town from Marvel. Marvel it, by then. It's who you know. It's not what you know. Yep. So Marvel at the time was on uh, Park Avenue South at 28th Street. So they were almost straight east of Upstart Associates, my studio. So I said, all right, what's in the comic? Oh, I said, first I said, oh, look, I, whatever job I was working on, before I was doing Thor, whatever I had to do for Marvel, you have to talk to Virginia Ramita because Virginia, John's wife, she is the schedule keeper. And she was a dragon. She was great. We love Virginia. I loved Virginia. But I said, you talk to Virginia, and if it's okay with her that my other whatever job I'm doing is going to be a day later, I'll do the cover. If she doesn't approve it, I'm not doing it. I know I'm married to you, but I'm still not doing it. So you talk to Virginia. Talk to Virginia, and she said, sure. And Weezy got along with Virginia really well. Love Virginia, like I do. So Virginia said, he called back in five minutes, less than five minutes. Said, okay. You can do the cover. So, okay, great. What's in the comic? Well, it turns out Conan fights demon this, demon that, demon something else, di and different animals. And a giant demon owl. And a giant demon owl. I said, okay, that's all I have to know. So I sat down. I penciled furiously. I penciled a picture of a giant owl dropping out of the sky with Conan upside down in his claws, trying to strangle him, I think, or something like that. And, uh, I pencil it in a couple of hours. I grab my pens, my brushes, uh, my rapidographs. I ink the crap out of it in an hour or maybe two hours. I got it all done by the middle of the afternoon, and I ran over to Marvel. I probably didn't run the whole way. But I never had any wind, but I did run as far as I could, as fast as I could go. Got it over there. Wheezy got it. They slapped a trade dress on it. They got it colored in 14 seconds. I have no idea who colored it George even back probably. then. George, eh, George probably colored, you're right. And got it colored, and it went out of the house that afternoon, just in time to make the comic book. And the really annoying part about all this for me, it remains one of my favorite covers <laughs> that I've ever done. I have worked at other covers I have sweated blood over. That cover, I just went <laughs> to get it finished. 
and it now hangs in our front hallway because it's still one of my favorite covers, and it annoys me every time I see it. It's also an anecdote. But it's also a good anecdote. Yeah. And it worked out. It came out really well. It was a good cover. Thank you, Simonsons. Yeah. It's been our it's pleasure. pleasure. Thanks it's for having me. It's a hard interview to talk. <laughs> I don't know about that, but it's been good to see you guys. You too. Uh, I, I hope we'll see you in real life down the road somewhere. I hope so, too. Yeah. So, yeah. You guys take care. Thank Everybody you. out there sees this. Take care. Be safe. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. All right. All right. Take care.